we got the best media guy in the world, I promise. He, um, nobody would notice that except I pulled up that w- bottle of water to take a drink, and he muted my mic <laughs> right there. <laughs> like, man, he's good. Okay. All right. Adrian, thank you for volunteering back there. I appreciate it. All right. Any attention? Yeah, <laughs> I see how it is now. <laughs> I see how it is now. Uh, we're going to go to war. Okay. Let's try that again. If you have paid any attention to the news in the past number of weeks, you've seen pictures of riots, you've seen uh, shootings by police, sometimes of unarmed people, you've seen a lot of crime, a lot of issues, you've probably seen some presidential debates where uh, I I was reading a column this week and uh, the guy said, the guy said that was writing the, the column said, it's reached the point where people in America pretty much expect politicians to lie and it doesn't change anything anymore. Is that true? Like, pretty much, right? We just kind of expect that to happen. You're like, well, that's politicians. You know, that's what they do. This week, I, um, I talked with a, a friend and, and um, he's frustrated with people around him and things out this person was doing him wrong and this person was doing him wrong and at the same time he with tears in his eyes sat across the table in my office and said why is it why is it that I try to do right and I can't and I try I think I'm gonna turn it around and then I don't and this morning he's in jail And I look at it and I say, man, I know a lot of people <laughs> like that. We live in the south side, right? That's, that's where we are. I know a lot of people who have real, real, real significant uh, issues and problems. Well, in the last month, my house has been broken into and my office has been broken into. <laughs> Things have been stolen the last, uh, it's, it's just kind of, if there was ever a day, if there was ever a day when we needed people to rise up and provide good leadership in a bad world, it would be today. Can somebody say amen? amen. Yeah. And so in the middle of a bad world, how do you provide good leadership? How do you lead well? In the middle of a world where dads don't stay, how do you provide us something different? In the middle of a world where all sorts of things change. Well, hi there. How are you? How's it going? Oh, it's it's okay. I've got six. (laughs) It's all right. I've got six kids and seven ones. My seventh one's on the way, and I'm golden with that. That's no problem at all. In fact, a little girl, that would be, uh, that'd be something else, wouldn't it? Wow. Um, I, mean, I know, mine's a boy, though. I got, got a girl that's 12 and six boys in a row. Wow, okay. It's all good. Where was I? I have no idea where I was. <laughs> Let's try again. I, I just want to tell you that in the middle of a bad world... It is possible for you to be in your context and in your place a good man, a good woman, a good leader in the middle of a bad, bad world. In fact, Paul wrote a letter to a man named Titus, a man who had become a Christian, had started working with Paul, and then Paul had traveled to the island of Crete and had gone to this, this beautiful island where there were about a hundred cities on the island of Crete, hundred towns and cities. He traveled there, he preached the gospel, some people got saved, and then Paul said, I'm going to move on, and he left Titus behind. The problem is Titus was, lift, was left behind on an island that was a bad place. It was a bad place. In fact, we're going to talk about that a little bit today. It was a bad place, a bad culture, not the kind of place where you really really want to be. 
But in the middle of a bad world, somebody needed to step up. Somebody needed to step in and fill the gap and say, I'll be a real man in the middle of a bad world, in the middle of a bad culture. And so the, the directions and the encouragement that Paul's giving Titus in this letter matters to you and me because I think, I, I, I look at you, you men that are out there, and I'm not leaving the ladies out, we're going to talk about ladies before this series is over, but you men that are out there, I look at your eyes and I am pretty confident that every one of you want to be a good man in the middle of a bad world. I think that's why you're here. Now, a few of you might be here because your wife drug you here, but, I, but overall, I think the reason that you're here is because you'd like to be a good man even in the middle of a bad world. You'd like to make a difference. If you're like me, I want this world to look different for me having passed through it, look better. And so how do we do that? Well, today we're going to jump into, uh, jump into a, a reading in Titus chapter 1, and he's going to talk about bad men. He's going to talk about bad men. Can we just stop for a second here, and can we just acknowledge that the world has bad men? people in it. Can we, just like, can we just admit that for a minute? Because somewhere along the line, I, I, was, I was talking and got in a Facebook argument this week. Anybody get any Facebook arguments in the last week? I got in a Facebook argument this week with a guy on a friend's wall who he, this guy said something and he commented back and they basically started arguing truth and morality, the philosophy of truth and morality. And it got pretty deep pretty fast, all right? But truth... Basically, here's what people believe about truth today. They believe what this guy believed. He said, the way you know something is true is if it works for you. He said, how you know something is true is if it works for you. Now, mull that over for a minute. Because a lot of us, a lot of the world lives that way because they believe that way. They don't believe necessarily anything is wrong unless it causes issues for them, right? And if it, if it works for them, then it should be okay for them to do. And they live as if I can do whatever. And you know what? The truth is the whole world is full of that philosophy. If it feels good, you, you know already. Well, you've heard that. Absolutely. That this is the way, like the 60s, right? It's, it's a, and it really, that, that philosophy began to take hold in that decade, really, really take hold in that decade. Is it, is it possible then that we could just stop and say, no, it is true, there are some things that are right, some things that are wrong, there are good people, and then there are people who do evil. Can we agree that that is true, just starting off here? Okay, Titus chapter 1, verse 10, let's start here. For there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. Now, push pause and quickly explain. That's a group of people that are in the first century world, and they are arguing that in order to be a Christian, you have to keep all the Jewish law, including the law about circumcision. We don't believe that in this world today. Jesus has fulfilled the law of, uh, of God for us, the Old Testament ceremonial law. We're grateful for that. But these people were saying, to be a Christian, you got to keep the law of Moses and be circumcised. And so they were causing some issues. Verse 11, here's what Paul says, they must be silenced because they are ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Even one of their own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Wow. Um, someone should get Paul a course in how to win friends and influence people because this is not really it, right? No, he's being honest. He's being honest. He's telling, he's speaking the truth about the world that Titus was called to minister in. You're going to go out, Titus, and you're going to speak about Jesus, and people aren't going to like it. Why? Because they're liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. You're going to go out, and you're going to tell people they've broken God's law, and they're not going to like it because they are liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. You're going to go out, Titus, and you're going to stand up for right, and people aren't going to appreciate it because there are evil people in the world. 
And then verse 13, he says, this testimony is true. By the way, this isn't even Paul saying that part about Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. He's quoting the Greek poet Epimenides. So this guy wrote this about people from Crete. Oh, they're bad, bad people. And Paul says, yep, they sure are. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the commands of those who reject the truth. What's he saying? Sometimes, sometimes in this world, you have to, you have to deliberately confront evil and say, that isn't right. That isn't right, and you shouldn't do it. I will never forget one time driving down the road with my mom. My mom is five foot two, and she is, the, she is the epitome of Alabama Southern sweetness, okay? That is just who she is. And it's 100% real. It is not fake at all. I've watched her all my life, and there's nothing fake about her. She is she just, oh, bless your heart. How are you doing? She just that loves people. I remember driving down the road with her one day, and she pulled up next to this guy, and he had been dry. He was one of those drivers. You know about those drivers? You know what I'm talking about, right? He's cutting people off, and he's pulling right up like until his bumper's like this far away from the bumper of the guy in front of him, and, and making good luck signs with one hand. At least I think it was good luck sign. And uh, three people caught that joke. Okay. And, and so my mom pulled up next to him. And she turned and she looked at him and she said, she, she didn't even say it out loud, she mouthed, you're being ugly. <laughs> and he looked at her like, and he kind of calmed down and backed off and just drove with the rest of us for the rest of the time. Like he wasn't really like, you want to scare that lady, right? Don't, don't do anything with that girl over there. Wow. Sometimes you need to be able to look the world in the face and say, that's wrong. You have to have something solid to stand on in order to be able to say, that's wrong. That's not right. You can't do that. It isn't true. It isn't right. It isn't pure. It isn't godly. God isn't pleased with that. So how do we, what do we stand on in that kind of a world? It, how, what do we, how do we have that kind of confidence what do you put your trust in? Is it your opinion? You see, the guy I was arguing with on Facebook, that's the problem. I said, uh, I'm curious if you take this, if you take this, this, what you're teaching, that if it works for you, it's fine, and you go all the way to the extreme, can you tell me that Hitler was bad because it worked for him? Right? I mean, he became the leader of a country, and they almost took over the world. And ultimately... When you're on the shifting sands of relative truth, where your truth might not be my truth, it works for you, but it doesn't really work for me. This works for me, but I can't really say it's wrong for you. If you're on those kind of shifting sands, you can't ever say something is wrong no matter what. And that's a problem. And Paul says, you need to be able to, to go up and say, this is not right. There are some things that are true. There are some things that are false. There are some things that are right. There are some things that are wrong wrong. So in this passage, we're going to keep on going. Let's, let's keep going on verse 14 and following. So they will pay no attention to Jewish myths or the commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Now, what he's talking about in this passage are, is a word that everybody wants you to learn today, okay? A new word, might be a new word for you, heretic. Everybody say heretic, okay? A heretic is a person who believes and teaches false doctrine. They do it on purpose. They, they say, I reject what this book says. I take what this book says. I don't believe what this book says, and I'm going to teach something other than what is the truth from this book. And so that person in the New Testament, they are dealt with extensively. In the last third of the Bible that was written by the followers of Christ, in this part of the Scripture, there are tons. In fact, out of the 29 books, 13 of them 13 of them deal with false teachers, heretics, people who teach error and wrong. 
In fact, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through that list, but there's a list of what they're called, just for your reference, okay? More than, more than 13 books, that's, did I say 29 books a while ago? Okay, 50%. Deal with heretics or false teachers. You're probably noticing that my math is a little messed up. Here's, what, here's the big idea, okay? If you're taking notes this morning, on your handout, you are a theologian. Everybody say theologian. A theologian, that's one of those big giant words that means this, a person who knows and studies God, okay? A theologian is a person who studies God. Theology is the study of God. And so you are, for better or for worse, a theologian. You're like, I don't even know what that word means. Well, until now, you didn't know, maybe you didn't know what it means, but you are one. You see, every single person believes something about God. You believe something about God. A.W. Tozer, a writer some years ago, said this. He said, tell me what you believe about God, and I will tell you what kind of person you are. What you believe about God, he said, is the most, what you, comes to mind when I say the word God, is the most important thing about you. That's true. In fact, let's just take a moment and let's illustrate it. Muslims. What comes to mind when I say the word God is something vastly different to them than it is to us. Both of us cannot be right. Can we, can we agree that if a per, if a per, the persons who make up the group that they're calling ISIS, you know, on the news, when I say the word God, what comes to their mind is vastly different and the way they live it out consequently is vastly different than what it means when I say to you, God and what I say to you, when I say the word God, what comes to your mind might be different than what comes to my mind, and it will show up in our life. If you believe God is a giant vending machine in the sky who you go to when you're hungry or tired or, or needy or, or something's going wrong in your life, and you plug in your 50 cents worth of prayer, punch the right code, and down drops the answer, if you believe that about God, it will show up in the way you live. If you believe that God is a mean taskmaster who's just watching, waiting for you to step out of line, it'll show up in your life. It will. The way you live will show that. If you believe that God is a big grandpa in the sky who, when his grandchildren down here on earth do wrong, he ruffles their hair and says, ah, boys will be boys. If you, <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, that's, yeah. If you believe that, about God, it will show up in your life. I promise you it will. You are a theologian. Now, Paul gives these, these, this little profile of him. He says, there are many rebellious people, mere talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision group. He gives this little profile of them. And here's the, the next blank. Most theological errors, most mistakes about what we believe about God come with one of two problems with them, either legalism or license. Legalism means this, it is a strict view of, of how you must keep the law of God and you earn your salvation by how good you are. Okay? Now, different people may measure themselves by different measuring stick. If you go to the Bible Belt, people may say, well, you can't smoke, drink, or chew, and some people say, well, if you go to the Northwest, they may say you have to recycle and, not, and only eat organic or, you know, whatever. Like they have, they fill in different blanks, but ultimately legalism is this idea that says, I am right with God because of the list of things that I do. That's legalism. The other end is license. The idea that, you know, basically... You know, God and me, we have an understanding. Like, we got this thing. Me and the man upstairs, we're cool. He knows I'm not perfect. I kind of do whatever I need to do and make stuff happen as best I can. And when we get to heaven, he's going to sort it all out, and I'm going to be fine. That's license. Basically, using grace, God's kindness, as an excuse to do whatever I want to do. Has anybody ever had the experience with your children? where your, your kids will do this license thing. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? Where they'll, they'll basically, yeah, they'll basically come along and say, uh, 
um, you know, mom said this, but what I think she meant was, and they reinterpret it to whatever it is they'd like to do at that time. How many of you had a kid that would do that? I'd have at least one kid that will do that. They'll just interpret it however they need to at the given moment, you know. But some of us do that with God. Right? That's one of the errors. Then I've seen some kids who were just worried all the time and scared all the time, and they weren't sure if they, they were rule keepers. Anybody have a rule keeper kid? Yeah, where they're just really super careful and they're just really conscientious and they're not sure if they did something wrong and they're legalism and license. Down the middle of those two errors is one road, and that road is called grace. That road is a road of grace. It recognizes two things. It recognizes that God is a God of holiness. He is a God of purity, and He is a God of law and standard. He does have a measuring stick, and he, we realize that we have failed to measure up to that, to that measuring stick. You and I and every single one of us, if we took the Ten Commandments and we said, let's start with, you shall have no other gods before me, uh-oh. <laughs> Anybody ever put anything above God? Ever? Yeah, 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 me too, me too. You say, you know, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to do this for the Lord. I'm going, to, I'm going to pray and talk to God. And then before you know it, you're like browsing YouTube and watching clips of, you know, looking, laughing at scary, what's, what's that grumpy cat? Laughing at, laughing at the grumpy cat on Facebook, you know. And, and you're like, actually, I think I just leapfrogged that and I put something ahead of God. <laughs> and you continue right down through there and we get to, you shall not lie and you shall not steal. And you shall not commit adultery. Oh, good, one that I kept. However, Jesus said, if you look at a woman in order to lust after her in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Ugh. And then, you shall not murder. Oh, good, I, I, another one I've kept. But Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. In other words, you and I, let's just be honest here, you and I are lying, stealing, thieving, murdering adulterers. That's, the, that's recognizing, that is, that's just the facts, y'all. That's recognizing the holiness and the purity of God. And he said, I want you to be like me. And we said, I'm not very good at that. But on this side over here, of the, we look at this side and we say, but you know what? God is a God of mercy and kindness. He died on the cross for our sins in our place to pay the price and raise us up to what we needed to be. You see, the Bible says that Jesus, Jesus, he made Jesus who knew no sin to become sin for us. That's the cross. So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He exchanged our sin for his righteousness in a moment of time by faith. And because of that, we walk this road called grace. We don't get over into legalism and freaking out because we didn't keep all the rules. We don't get over into license and say, well, I guess it doesn't matter what I do. We don't get into either of those ditches. We stay on the road. You are a theologian. And if you want to be solidly committed to making a difference in this world, you better understand your God, and you better understand how to walk the road called grace. Because when you get out into the world and you start saying, that's wrong, and standing on the truth of God's word and saying, that isn't right, the Bible says so, you better understand that you have the right to say that not because you've kept all those rules, not because you've been perfect, but because God has forgiven you and changed your heart. That's why you have the right to say that. See, I'm talking to some of you who have family members who are doing wrong. Sons, daughters, maybe moms, dads, husbands, wives, and you know it. And when you say something to them, if you're going to make a difference in that kind of world, you have to be honest with them. Like, you have to be willing to say to your children, dads, that isn't right. Not because it inconvenienced you, but because it's true. This is where you stand. You want to provide leadership to your family, you've got to be able to say, 
that isn't right because the Bible says so, son, daughter, that's not right. But when they come back, as they always will, with, oh yeah, well, what about the time you... I'm not saying that I've got it all together. I'm not saying I've got it all right. What I'm saying is, by God's grace, He has forgiven me, and I'm doing my best to walk with Him, and I'm trying to help you do the same. Am I making sense to anybody this morning? Okay. You've got to be willing to say that. Now, here's why you have to stop some men. Okay, we're working our way through the passage. Number one, they will ruin others. They will ruin others. They must be silenced. They're ruining whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Literally, this means to muzzle them or gag them. It doesn't mean they're gonna, Paul's going to kill them. Okay? <laughs> it just means you need to shut them up. You, you, these guys, they can't be allowed to have that. An attitude, an attitude is contagious. How many know that's true? Attitude is contagious, isn't it? You go out and you're like, um, you, you, what attitude you have tends to reproduce itself in other people. I have a couple of kids who in their, in their heart, they have this attitude thing, and we are really, really working on that right now. The reason we are is because attitude corrupts. It spreads If it's a good attitude, it spreads good. If it's a negative attitude, it spreads negative. And so there's times when you gotta shut you gotta say, No, that can't happen. You gotta shut it up. I'm gonna keep going. Number two, their targets are too easy. Their targets are too easy. They're teaching will spread like gangrene. (laughs) You see, there are other people around, there are other people around your children. And those people will teach your children. If your kids are in a public school, my kids are homeschooled for a very specific reason. Yes, do bless you. All right. My children are in a homeschool for a very specific set of reasons, and that is... I am called to train my children. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot have your kids in a, in a public school. I'm not saying that. Okay? that uh, I'm not saying that they can only be in a Christian school or home school. What I am saying is this, that you better understand that your child is an easy target for people who teach error. They are easy targets for people who teach error. They will have a science teacher who tells them, this book cannot be trusted. I promise you they will. Maybe one of them, maybe one teacher doesn't, but they're going to go through 12 grades in college. They're going to have a science teacher who tells them, you can't believe what this Bible says about God creating the world. It'll happen. So in that kind of a situation where it's not in the church and you can't silence that teacher, you can't gag them, you can't muzzle them, what do you do? The answer is you better be a theologian and you better know the Bible, and you better know the arguments, and you better get a hold of some good material. If you need some, let me know. I've got DVDs and whatever else that can help you defend this book and say, no, the truth is that have you considered the fact that the, the uh, assumptions that evolutionists make are basically in some ways the same kinds of assumptions? They, we weren't here to see the world created. They weren't here to see the world evolve. We both make assumptions based on the same evidence. What about, what if we can reconsider the evidence? What are you you doing? You're presenting an alternative understanding of what this, uh, of the evidence. You're presenting the facts, the truth, in an effort to make sure that your children know the truth. The targets are easy. I don't want my kids paying any attention and hearing and receiving and soaking in the philosophy that the world teaches. If it feels good, do it. No. No, that's not the philosophy I want my children growing up with. And I have a responsibility to make sure, by the way, did you know that your children are taught every single day by TV and video games and DVDs? Did you know this? They're taught that. They're taught, those are teaching tools. 
You say, no, nah, my kids don't soak up anything from it. Really? Because people will pay millions of dollars for a 30-second commercial because they want to control your behavior. They will. They'll pay millions of dollars for the chance to get a Doritos ad in front of people because they know they will get it back in sales. They will make you think of Doritos and you'll buy it. They know it. So, again, do you understand that the minds, the targets are easy? The targets are easy. So sometimes, this is, this is the truth, I will hear something on a kid. I, there have been times where I've heard something on one of my kids' DVDs, and I'll stop the DVD and say, now let me, let me tell you what, that's not true. There have been times where I've taken DVDs that they, were, they had or were bought or were given and tossed them in the trash because I'm not doing it. I'm going to silence that guy. That guy's teaching error into my home. He's teaching my kids. It was a, one a while back that my kids had, and there was a song in it. There was like, uh, you've got to find your own way. And the, the context of, the, of it was like, no matter what your parents say or your teachers say, you've got to find your own way. I'm like, no, uh No, no, you're not going to come in here and tell my kids that. Shut up. Silenced. Right? That's exactly what it is. I could go on so long there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stop and keep moving. Number three, okay, let's keep moving. Number three, their corruption goes to the core. To the pure, all things are pure. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. Nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny Him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Here's what I've, I got I to gotta tell you on this one. It's not what you keep out that makes you pure. And it's not what you don't do that keeps you pure. Oh, I sat across the, the table from that guy that I, I was talking about early in the message. I sat across the table from him, and he said, why is it that I decide I'm going to stop doing this? I'm going to cut off the drugs. I'm going to stop doing dope. I'm going to stop with this, and I, it's like I can't help it. He said, in that moment, I want to do it. In that moment of temptation, I want to do it. In that moment of anger, I want to hurt that person. I want to say those unkind words. Why is it that I can't stop? Well, here's, here's why. Here's why. Because purity is not a list of things. You know what? Here's the list of things I'm going to stop. Let's write it all down. I'm going to stop drugs. I'm going to stop this. I'm going to stop cursing. I'm going to stop this. Purity is not a list of things you stopped. Purity is an inside job. Purity has to come from in here and work its way out to here. The problem is that your heart and mine are not born pure. And so you can go to uh, confession and burn a candle and talk to an AA group and, do, and, and tell, tell your girlfriend you're going st to start over and tell them, make promises you're never going to do that again. And, and then you can, like me, you can stomp your foot and say, no, this time I really mean it. I'm not going to do it again. But the truth is, if the seed is in here, the fruit's going to come out in your life. And these men he's talking about are men who are evil because they've never dealt with the heart of the problem. Because the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And what you need to do, if you're going to be a good man in a bad world, what you need to do is not, is not make a bunch of New Year's resolutions. Now, that's not it. You don't need to make, a, you, you might make a list. You might make a list of things you're wanting to say, but it's not going to help ultimately. What you've got to do is you've got to go to God and you've got to say, I've got a problem here. And I don't know how to take care of this. I don't know what to do about this. And I'm asking for your help. Please forgive my sin and give me the courage and the grace to deal with it. Please, you come in and rule and reign in my heart. You see, this is what the Scripture 
talks about when it says, I was crucified with Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet it's not me, it's Christ who lives in me. What's he saying? I have died to sin. Jesus came into my heart and he rules and he reigns there, conquering sin in the present in my life. He rules and reigns there. And so then, to the pure, all things are pure. If you are a person who is pure in here, then you want to do right. And you hunger to be the right with God. I'm not saying the devil never tempts you. I'm not saying you don't have bodily drives. I'm not saying that, that friends won't talk in your ear and try to draw you away. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, in your heart, you want to do right. I want to be a good man. I want to do right. And that's the power of the change Jesus brings about in our life. Purity is an inside job. So what are we going to do about this together, men? What I'm calling you to do, what I'm calling you to, is I'm calling you to a life. I'm calling you to a life that runs deeper than just an hour a week on Sunday. I'm calling you to a life that runs deeper than, you know, I go to church. No, you're a theologian. What do you believe about God? Are you living that out in your life? Do you believe that God asks of you purity and that He is able to produce in you purity? Do you believe this to be true? I'm calling you to a life that is deeper than just, uh, I, I, I drop a dollar in the offering plate. No, I'm talking about a, a life where God owns everything about you. I'm calling you to a life to make a difference in a world that is going crazy and going mad. Now, I have people and friends on Facebook who think that they've got this thing figured out. And they, they, I think, as best I can understand by what I read, they think that the way to fix the culture that we're struggling with right now, in a culture where we say there is no such thing as gender, male and female, unless it's what you, whatever, you, whatever works for you, Whatever you believe you are, whatever you identify as, that's great for you. In a world like that, in a world where there are riots in Charlotte and Baltimore and Ferguson, Missouri, in a world where politicians lie because we expect them to lie, in a world where business men cheat and manipulate and to enrich themselves. In a world where people are addicted to things because they can't handle the reality of waking up without the help of that substance. In that kind of world, how do we fix it? How do we fix it? Well, I know, let's pass some new laws. Let's elect a different party. Let's uh, start a petition drive. No, no. What I'm calling you men to is to be a man. To be a man in the middle of a world with dads that don't stay. You stay. In the middle of a world where dads are not involved, you be involved. In the middle of a world where people don't care about purity in their eyes, you care about it. In the middle of a world where people don't think deeply about, they think more deeply about call of duty than they do about their Bible, you be a guy who thinks deeply. In the middle of a world where guys are like, oh, I'll just wait till I'm 37 and then I'll grow up, you grow up now. Go ahead. I know you're only 17. Would it kill you? Would it kill you to go ahead and grow up? All right. In a world where where men, this is true, this, is, this statistic, I read this statistic and it blew my mind. Men between 18 and 30 statistically are more likely to live with their parents than they are with a girlfriend or a spouse. They're more likely, men 18 to 30, are more likely statistically to live with their parents than... than in that kind of world, 
I am calling to you, and God is calling to you, be a man. Be a man who's willing to stand up for truth and right and say, this is right and this is wrong. And we know the difference between the two. And the way I say, the way I define that is this book right here. No, I'm not saying I've got it all together. What I'm saying is Jesus has changed my life and I'm not afraid to admit it. And he is revolutionizing who I am. He's changing my relationships and making me pure in my interactions with my girlfriend and with my wife and with my family and with, with the outside world. He's making me a man of ethics and purity and truth and honesty and righteousness. And that's what we're calling you to. Because the truth is we need leaders. We need leaders. Men who can stand up and be men and say, no, we're going to shut that down because we're going this way. You can do that. You can do it with your family. You can decide that that's going to be who you are in today's world. Would you bow your heads with me and let's pray.